Hey, it's good to see everybody here today for another Rip Burtman Coaches Cafe. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about the I to We organization and uh, where I to We is going, some of the new exciting things that are happening, but also some uh, testimonies. I to We is the parent organization for Grip Burtman. So if you're a Grit Bartman coach, you are a part of that larger community of I to We. Uh, it also will include a lot of people who will not be Grit Bartman coaches. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, some of the ideas for the future. And I hope that all of you will be sharing some of those with us today, too, as well as some of your own experiences. Uh, John Blake, uh, I want to start out with you, of course, as the team leader for I to We and the president of the I to We organization to just give us a few thoughts that you have about um, where we're going with all of this. Uh, I, I don't see the world changing today from being an eye-centered world. Uh, and that means that uh, the need for I to we, I, I see it continuing to grow, uh, continuing to be relevant in today's culture, in today's church, as uh, the aspirational value of unity, the aspirational uh, goal of of community has taken a backseat to practicalities of how we actually do that, of how we can transform that from this idealized value and make it something practical. And so, uh, where is I do we headed? We our our intent is to continue to make that transformation tangible, continue to make that transformation something that's within grasp of individuals that are trying to find out how do we live in kingdom community, in kingdom body life. How do we do that? And so, uh, as we continue to grow and and expand our services ways that we can connect that will be at the forefront how how do we make that transformation a reality how can we make it tangible for people so we'll continue to evaluate how we can utilize our current assessments make them more accessible uh, to more people and look at ways that we can provide equipping opportunities ways that we can collaborate with people that are doing it well and share their stories uh, as well as then come alongside those that, that need additional support. So talk to us about some of those ways that we can help people. How, how can I to we help people in those specific areas you were talking about, making that transformation from an I culture to a, to a true we unity culture? Well, I think it's all the things that that we value. It's the reason why why uh, you're either on this call or you're listening to this call is because we share some uh, some values, some principles, some some paradigms that guide uh, us. And so, in the Ida Week community, our goal is to to elevate those, uh, to give those uh, postures, to give those principles a platform so that we can generate the conversation around it. Um, so you'll begin to see more conversation generation, uh, whether that be through social media or whether that be uh, in different uh, areas, uh, opportunities like this, where we can continue to have a meaningful conversation about those postures, uh, places like uh, how can we equip more people to, uh, to guide people through a team development process. So whereas we've had Grip Berkman coaches training, now we're actually going to be doing Grip Plus facilitator training. Uh, for those of you that are already Grip Berkman coaches, we have that Plus facilitator training. We're in the process right now of developing an I to We coaches process, uh, a coaching process. That about nine months out still, but we're already in the works for that, for people to be able to uh, come alongside and support others on their journey. You talked about... Um that I to we coach being more of a process. Could you expand on that just a little bit more? Yeah, well, and actually I wanna, I wanna touch on something about our, uh, about the, the core, where we started. I mean, yeah. when, when you have the conversation with Paul, this started with church mobilization, right? This started with the idea of how do we get people out of the pews to fully engage and embrace and understand God's unique design on their life and their contribution to the body of Christ. Uh, and so, I don't I don't ever want to lose that. The the this is about empowering people to understand their unique fit within the body of Christ so that we can live in that perfect unity that John 17 talks about 
and so that then we can expand the body of Christ so that we can then help other people understand that. So I think that's a really important component of that, that this is, it's not just about team effectiveness. It's not just about unity for the sake of unity. This is also about uh, empowerment and mobiliza- mobilizing the church to be the church. And so that's just, uh, it, it's fun to to think about those places where people have that aha moment of, wait, there's really a place for me in this. There's really a unique contribution that I'm making in the body of Christ. I, I'm new. I, you know, what what could I possibly offer to then see them them light up with that opportunity to really uh, dig into that? So uh, as far as the process for I to we, I think it, it really is a process of, of understanding where we're at today, understanding what are the unique uh, challenges, what are the unique opportunities of of any team or any organization. And in the I to we uh, model, we have a way to essentially take a look and see how they're doing and what we consider to be the seven essential postures of any team or organization on their journey from I to we. And so with that, uh, with that framing, then able to have the conversation, understand where they're at at that starting point that's unique to any team, unique to any organization, and then begin to determine if there might be assessments that could be valuable to give us that common language to talk about things and to walk with them uh, through that process. It, it's something where, you know, a, as an organization, we're more than happy to to journey with, but we're really trying to set this up so that team leaders that might be, uh, you know, that might really understand these uh, these postures or these principles that that are passionate about them, that hopefully there will be a lot that that they can sort of take and run with themselves, so that they're not somehow reliant on on an organization or on us. We really want to empower team leaders and empower those that love to come alongside others to have the resources, have a new model, a new framing to be able to really walk with others in this journey. Even when we have been training Grit Burtman coaches, we've touched on some of those things, but uh, our training with Grit Burtman coaches necessarily has to focus on use of those assessments because we need them to be technically prepared. Uh, Les Bumbernard, you've been leading several of those coach trainings. Um, and uh, uh, Grady King, you've led a lot of those down through the years. Uh, for you guys to kick in, um, what I'd really like for you and, and the rest of you also that are on the call with us to share a little bit about um, in the experiences that we have already been having about training people, how important has it been to get this uh, this idea of building unity and not just helping individuals to understand themselves, not just get to awareness, but really getting in the the moving to we component. Uh, Any perspective that you might have on how that has led us to this point of saying, yeah, we really need to do more. We need to expand and not just be Grit Berkman. There's got to be more than just that. Does that spark any thought for either of you guys? Or, or for that matter, any of the rest of you, Matt, Susan, Les, particularly, uh, those of you that have been training for a while. Grady? It's so easy to, from my experience to get, to get uh, obsessed with the tool yeah. and the individual, as you've mentioned. And it's, it's, we've been so individualistic in our understanding of body life that when we try to move people to you know, they, okay, we understand all that stuff. Now let's get to the tool. And so I've, I've struggled at times to find ways to get them and get them engaged before ever walking through the tool, which is what I do. We is trying to do. That's why I'm excited about this foundational stuff, the principles. But when I get into a team build or coach training, people tend to gravitate toward themselves and the tool itself. And for then there's not much follow-up afterwards. There's no, I'm trying to find somebody that's the champion in that church to follow up with the principles and apply it after we coach, after we train. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, talk to me a little bit more about that. Uh, well, it's a, ch it's a challenge, and I haven't done too many. I'm getting ready to do one in Little Rock, Arkansas. Not a not a coach training, but a, actually a elder group in a couple of weeks. And um, you know, a couple of them have already sent their tool. They're excited about the tool. They're excited about talking about themselves. And I've worked with this group before, and this group particularly remains individualistic. This is my third trip with them, not doing Grit Berkman. This is the first time I'm doing, well, I'm actually doing just Grit to introduce them to it. And every time I'm there, I talk about these values, some of these values, state them maybe a little differently. And when I leave and get a report back from the minister, he says, oh, we're back to the same old, same old. Everybody functions as individuals and we're still operating. So this is a struggle. It is not, it is not an easy journey. Um, accountability. A champion in the local context is essential, and I haven't had that so far. They're not resistant. They only know what they know, and they've only they just default to their DNA. I mean, that they just default to the DNA. Um, even when they nod, yeah, that's us, that's us, that's us. And I talk about practical steps to avoid that or to move in a different direction, and they go, yeah, that really sounds good. Six, three months later, the minister goes. Uh, it's not happening. Why, why do you think that is, Grady? Why is it not happening? No accountability, <clears throat> no structure. <clears throat> We're not, it, it's, it, Canadians would say process. I say process because I'm, <laughs> and so it it is process resistance. People are worn out, they're exhausted. And when I'm in crisis, they default to what they know and what they're comfortable with. Uh, not people, I, me, you. And so yeah. we, we're undergoing so much. There's got to be an element. I haven't talked to uh, John Blake about this. John, I haven't talked to you about it. But I think given the culture we're in and the crisis we're in, given the anxiety that we all feel, somehow we've got to get that on the table before we ever start talking about the postures. We, we've got to find it, tap in where they are emotionally long before we get to this. I, I may be way off base here, but I think they default to their own DNA in times of crisis. We all do it. That's why I don't want the 7-Eleven songs and I want to sing Old Rugged Cross and, and when I feel stressed. I mean, it's, it's true. Larry and Susan know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, and I think I think one thing is language and vocabulary. Uh, Larry and I were doing some writing yesterday uh, for this project we're working on with Paul Ford, and and um, you know we've been around this a long time, and and we're still trying to get words and phrases that communicate that this is not just about me; it's about all of us. It's about the body, and it's about how we. Um, work together and co cooperate together in the body and um, that we see ourselves as a body not just individuals and I think I think we continue to to need to get language around that and I, I think you're absolutely right Grady that we default to what what we've always done to what's comfortable for us and in the busyness of of uh, society today everyone is so so busy that that um taking the time to do the things that that are mentioned in the postures like abiding like thriving and then all of those others that lead to that that healthy body life um because it does start with us we've got to abide in christ first as an individual before we can have a healthy body life um, but the busyness of our culture and the anxiety and things that you mentioned, Grady, are also um, really work against us in that in that area. Les, I'd, I'd love to hear you know your your take on this. Les and I got a chance to work together. Uh, I guess it was a little over a year ago now um, it, with a church that was really hurting, uh, mm -hmm. right? And and really in a, in a tough place. Unless you did a a really wonderful job of of essentially a pushing the brakes a little bit for that brokenness. And I think, you know, to, to your point, Larry, and, and less really to your question, less cool to your question of process, it's, it's knowing the starting point of the group that you're with is so critical before you begin to move them forward. 
Um, Les, will you talk a little bit about sort of observation, how, how you determine that, how you feel that out with a group, as well as then even, you know, some of the tools and different things that, that you highlight in some of those moments of, of brokenness, that's almost a pre getting into some of this, of, of a little bit of healing before we get to that space. Yep. Yeah. I'd like to hear that. Yeah. I think the, it's easy for us to think about how we want to move somebody to something. And obviously as coaches and facilitators, a huge part of that is us having conversations and listening and understanding kind of where they're at and where they're heading. But the reality is, I think for a lot of teams and particularly given what Grady's talking about, um, you have to start where they are. And a lot of them are not in a point at a place where they can just dive into a process that moves them towards something. They've got baggage, they've got issues, they've got challenges that they're facing. You know, the team that John's referencing had just been through a significant um, and very turbulent transition. And so to, to not acknowledge that and to not address that, I, whatever we would have done in kind of a more normal process would have been fraught with inefficiency. And I don't think it would have had a lot of traction because they're still they're still wrestling with all of the things that have got them there. So it's okay, how do we how do we recognize where they are and deal with what got them there before we start thinking about where we're going? And I think it's easy. And that's where I think the challenge comes into play with, oh, we just have this thing. <laughs> and that that's where it's not that helpful yeah. because applying the thing, whether it's the grip Berkman or any of these other things that we do without understanding the context of where the people are and what they're dealing with and having some time to address that, it limits the ability for you to make any progress. You know, you know, you can do, you can do, you could say, man, I, man, I wish, I wish your leg worked, you know, okay, I get this great process for making your leg work, but, oh, I'm not going to deal with the fact that it's broken first or that you, you got some big, you know, damage or whatever. Like, I think that's the challenge and we have to go into these things. And in our coach training, we talk about the need to be spending a lot of time with the leader, thinking through kind of where they are in terms of the developmental phases of groups and all the rest of that. But I think it also it often now gets down to bigger challenges because COVID and the societal shifts that we've um, been engaged in have been exceptionally disruptive. Like I'm I'm dealing with a church right now where the, the thing's blown up. And the reason it's blown up is because of all of these kinds of COVID related dynamics in terms of polarization and, you know, all the rest of that. So I'm not going to just go in there. Oh, okay, good. we got this process. No, we got to go in there and think that stuff through first and try and do a bit of control and, and healing on that before we can get to the place where we can do the other stuff. So, so uh, John, go ahead. Well, I, I think there are, two really important elements in this of what we're talking about of of understanding one is is that listening posture of of really seeing where where there's brokenness and I, you know one additional piece on that is oftentimes as we're getting into these um we're getting a pretty flat picture uh, of that because we're usually only talking with one person or maybe two that's where sort of that broader conversation uh, of how can we, you know, how can we determine this? I actually think this is one of the benefits of the eye to we overview assessment because it allows more people to speak into that. It gives us a little more perspective on that, allows us to ask a little bit better questions on the front end to that regard. The, the other piece though, and one of the things that we're building into the eye to we coaches training that I think is really important that, that both uh, Les and, and Grady have touched on is, is the idea of their culture right? The, what is ingrained in their culture already? What's already part of their DNA? And how do we hold up enough of a mirror for them that they can understand and identify some of those things? 
um, you know, we talk about culture being the, it's the water that we're swimming in, right? So you can't really see it, but that's the benefit that an outside perspective brings. And if you're a team leader, then who can, who can help you with that? Who can give you some of those insights to, you know, I was working with an outstanding team really, uh, but they had uh, unintended, pretty strong hierarchical structures that, that they couldn't see. They, they didn't notice that how strong that was. And they were trying to generate creativity. Well, hierarchy is one of the, the major blocks to creativity often. And so for us to be able to elevate that conversation through, hey, let's just understand your culture, do a bit of a, a just a cultural analysis of seeing, hey, what, what is true of your culture right now? And that, you know, like, like we talk about in, uh, in some of our other trainings, there's, there's things in every culture that, that block body life, you know, they, they get in the way and there's other things that, that will actually be great bridges, things that we can really leverage or utilize. And so being able to come in, evaluate, look at those things um, a, a little bit broader and, and you don't have to do a full anthropological cultural analysis to do that, but to really be able to just get a sense of what are some of the important things in this culture? What are some of those dominating characteristics put that next to where are they today what of it is ongoing what of it is brokenness and today as far as where we're at that really give us a picture about diving into the process or understanding our starting point the process yeah because you've got you've got culture and you've got crisis there you go and and the two of those end up if you if you don't if you're not attentive to those you're you're not going to be that effective i think you know, one of the things in the Grip Berkman coach training that kind of helps and points us in this direction is that whole section we do in the training on the big picture, where we we spend the time talking about the difference between the cultural values versus healthy biblical values. And we we talk about kind of Christ at the center, and we talk about some of the body life principles. So even there, like we probably, uh, what would be the right way to put this? I suspect that many coaches, when they go to work with a team, they don't spend enough time on that with the team. They go right to, you know, floor exercises and, and all the rest of this. But my experience has been, if you sit down with a team and, and you say, hey, okay, I want us to spend a bit of time and look at these different cultural values and, and the biblical values that connect with those in terms of contrast, and let's have a conversation, man, uh, most teams I go to, they could talk for a long time about that. And it's a really healthy conversation. But that's just another example of, okay, let's not just not just talk about the tool and just implement the tool. Let's actually have the conversations that help us frame how we're going to address that in a way that helps shift people's mindsets to that more body life type of orientation and a biblical orientation. Because that's actually at the core of what's gone on. You know, we, we've kind of lost our way in terms of the biblical values. And, you know, a guy that I grew up listening to would always say this, either either you're becoming more like the world or the more, world's becoming more like the church. Okay, well, we're becoming a lot more like the world these days. So then we got to battle that, I think, and try and figure out how to address that. Les, I heard you use the word time several times. Uh, and and your your illustration, your metaphor of the broken leg, uh, we we tend to want to go to the doctor and have one doctor visit and come away and be healed. But um, healing takes time. Assessing takes time. Uh, we talk a lot about you know wanting to ask and assess and not assume. But uh, sometimes I think when we start out with the assessments, we have already assumed something just by the fact that we start out with those assessments rather than sitting down and spending time with those teams. Um, what I hear you saying is the coach who's going to see some real change in the teams he's working with or he or she is working with needs to spend more time with them than just a one and done workshop. Is that what I'm hearing from you? I, I would say so, yes. I think there has to be um, some collaboration and conversation. I think what, like John's point of 
even beginning to utilize some of these new tools that we have available to give us a window into where teams are at, but it also gives them a window into where they're at, which is really helpful because those are things that they may not be self-aware of either. But I do think the the more time and energy we put into understanding the current reality and acknowledging the current reality in terms of how we're going to approach what we're doing with this team, the better off we're going to be and the better off they'll be, which is ultimately the only thing that matters. Yeah. Grady, uh, I, from what from what you were talking about earlier, it sounds to me like you usually do spend more than just one session with a group or a team. I try to. I would say I'm successful about 30% of the time. Oftentimes it's one-off weekends and I do good to get four hours, five hours, or a Friday night for two and a half and a Saturday morning for three and a half. And, and sometimes I'm just able to do grip and sometimes I'm able, I usually spend Friday night doing um, you know, uh, appreciative inquiry kind of things to get them to open up and talk. And, um, and then Saturday morning night, you know, 30% of the time I get more than one session, uh, like this particular group, this is my fourth trip and two years with them. Um, and they tend to be a single person in the elder group. There's, there's one guy that does, that's very gifted, travels internationally, doesn't realize he's actually the bottleneck to the whole group. And, and so I'm going in ahead of time to spend an evening with him and just, you know, talk to him. We're going to have church one-on-one -on -one. <laughs> and hopefully, wow. you know, he's a great guy and he's probably the most gifted elder they have, but he's also the bottleneck of the group. So Anyway, to answer your short answer, 30% of the time, I get multiple sessions. The rest of them, I do good to get one session with a little bit of Zoom follow-up, usually with the pastor, the minister, somebody like that. It's seldom about, oh, we can't afford you. I, I seldom hear that. Really? No, it's about time, schedule, crisis. It's seldom, you know, oh, it's not that we can't afford it. We're just having trouble getting everybody together. La da 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 la da 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 is Hebrew for come on. So Matt, now you knew I was going to call on you and give you a little time there to uh, get prepared. Uh, I, what, what, I, what, I, what I wanted to ask you, Mac, is how universal is what we're talking about here? Is this just a USA, Canada thing, or is this really universal with overseas as well? I, I think there's some ways it plays out. You mentioned culture. I think there's some ways that it plays out in the US and in, in Canada probably differently. Uh, I, I don't. I think it's a universal issue. I don't think it looks the same everywhere or has the same kind of uphill battle in the same ways. I, I think, you know, I, I was just thinking, well, what, what's, what's the setting where you could actually see these things develop? It, is it colleagues at work? Is that is that the setting where this thing is? These postures are really going to make a transformation happen? Is it is it a whole church? Uh, that we're looking to, to take the whole church and the whole church is going to redo the way that they function. Is it teams? I, I think often the reason it comes back to an individual thing is because we're not really sure where that thing's supposed to have its life, right? I mean, we, we, we have an idea maybe, but not something that people can get. And John mentioned some tangible things, not something I think people can get a hand around. What am I going to do differently and where am I going to do that differently? Is, is this, this the way our small groups are going to function? Because the truth is, some of the postures, I cannot live that out in a large group setting. I just can't. I can't live it out with people that I see once a month. That's just not really possible. I can grow in that. I can live differently, but then I'm back to me, right? So I think one of the things that maybe we see differently in the, in the North American setting and in, in, in some places internationally is that we have a lot more time together with people and we we live at a different pace of life so that some of our groups can i think interact differently where we're if it takes time maybe we have a little bit more time or maybe we give time to it not that people don't have things going on but i think the pace of life and the hurry the hustle the bustle of north america i think is a challenge um that 
we can have in other places. I mean, I live in a city of half a million. It's not a small town that I live in. So there's a lot going on here. You have to travel to get from place to place. But I do see that as a, as a hindrance. But I think we have to think, where do we want people to live this out? Uh, where, where do we actually think that this could actually take hold and be a different sort of thing? Um, and I'm not sure that that's always, I mean, we talk maybe leadership team, maybe an elder team. I, I work on a mission team. Those function differently than a staff at a church, definitely. So maybe it lives a little bit better in a mission team. I could see that. So I think there are some difference. I think the, the problem is universal maybe around the world. I think it does play out differently in different places, though. John, it, 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 it seems to me still that when we're looking at the seven postures of I to we, of moving from I to we, um, abiding, thriving, discerning, trusting, caring, um, connecting, and then that tactical posture uh, principle of, of accomplishing, it still seems to me that so many people, when they're doing another workshop, another get together, another assessment or whatever, they're ultimately still focusing on that accomplishing thing and not giving the time and the energy to those other postures that we think are so important. Uh, you got any thought on that? I think where we see that oftentimes is, um, you know, in, in, in the larger organizations that, that uh, are, are counting, you know, how many, how many times did you share your faith this month? Uh, how many, how many, uh, baptisms that we have and those, those aren't bad things you know obviously those initial measures were created really from uh, a, a, a posture of expanding the body of Christ I, you know so I think what happens is when when we get those uh, accomplishing metrics feels pretty hard-nosed and we haven't connected it back to the seven where we see it in isolation and we don't see it as part of a whole that that's really where it becomes a little more dangerous, frankly, where it becomes then more about the uh, the the metrics or the process step rather than the um, the foundational items being in place, how we're doing that effectively, and their relational being uh, integrated as well. So uh, it, I, I think from from a consulting lens or when you're brought into situations usually it's because the accomplishing isn't happening well yeah that then becomes the challenge of again looking at that entry point the presenting problem is not always truly what the core problem or what the real problem is and so part of what you have to do is really peel back the onion enough to understand to see and to be able to have that uh, that conversation M matt to your point i think that's you know one of the things that that I really uh, am excited about for the postures as we continue to use them more is the postures aren't going to change. The postures truly will be universal. The context and what, what we need to emphasize, where we need to lean in and how we need to do that is going to change dramatically. And one of the things that uh, my wife and I are, are on the front end of, of trying to commit to is, is let's look at the Ida we postures in our marriage and in our home. Uh, how, how do these apply to us? And so even beginning to think about any time where there's more than one person, uh, these eye to we postures become relevant and they are going to play themselves out differently in a, uh, you know, in, in a different, more relational culture versus a, a mega church versus a small group in a, in a Christian school of teachers from a you know uh, a hard nosed uh, organization that that is trying to figure out how they can bring a little more relationship into their picture. So you know it's it, the postures aren't going to change. The context will change very much though. So it's going to be exciting to continue to play that out. Brandon is uh, one of our newer coaches in our community. Um, I'd like to hear from you. Any any perspective you've got on any of this we've been talking about this morning? Well, I think I think it's intriguing. One of the <clears throat> context for me, um, I've mainly you know I've done debriefs, individual debriefs. I've mainly done, and then uh, recently have ventured into doing group work with my own team at my own church context. And so, but I've been doing that. When you when you talk about knowing the context, I'm like, wow, this is. I mean, for me personally. Um, how it's been applied, right? I know my context. 
in my church situation. I know my leadership team, um, which then I was like, okay, it's time for me to bring in Grip Berkman. And so I did Grip one year and spent a year debriefing the entire team and then came back this year and did uh, some Berkman talked about the values yet again, and then did some more floor mapping. So we've been on a, a two-year journey uh, of doing this with the goal of moving from I to we. Now, I was really fortunate that my leadership team had remained the same mostly during that entire time, um, you know, because as soon as we have some turnover here, probably in the fall, you have to begin that conversation all over again, because then defaults, I think, are going to come back in when you have three of your seven team turnover. And so that's a big challenge is turnover. How do you, you know, maintain culture in the midst of, of massive turnover with commitment levels being, I think, lower than they used to be with the younger generation? Yeah, that's, but, but having that tremendous advantage of being an internal coach to be able to have ongoing um, building and the relationship. Uh, wow, what, a, what an advantage that can be, right? Yeah, I think is, so. Is, is there any disadvantage to being an internal coach that way? Yeah, well, what was really interesting in leading this is, you know, as the, the leader, leader leading the, the, the session versus, and then I'm also the leader of the team, you know, having some of those conversations of identifying the leadership to, to team um, became a little awkward and challenging at times, you know, to say, you know, what do you see in the leader? What do you need, you know? What do you need from the leader? And and what could be really helpful and it was vulnerable. So I, I don't know. It, it still felt like it could be a, a negative thing, but it ended up being a really positive thing as well. It helped, helped some of our most vulnerable conversation we had in a year here back a couple months ago. Yeah. Wow. With, with, with you as the leader showing your vulnerability and uh, setting the pace, setting the example for them so that they too will then open up and be vulnerable. That's That's fantastic. So, John, what else have, have you, are you seeing that we really need to touch on today that we haven't touched on? Well, I guess, you know, with, with this group, I just love to pose the question, you know, one of the things that we really uh, highlighted in the last newsletter, we really highlighted two key elements of that, one being the new translations, that that we're expanding that, that we're really uh, working hard to to make sure that we have the simplified Chinese traditional, that we have the uh, French, Spanish, and and Russian complete for for the grip. Um, so around that, you know, thoughts on potentially other languages. We've a little bit of conversation around uh, the our values of is there. Is there a need or opportunity for us to potentially translate that? I've had a couple of requests uh, in the past couple of weeks to translate that as well. Is that something we should look at? So just curious people's take on that. And, and you know, one of my greatest concerns, you know, I'll say it that way, uh, it is if you just translate the assessment, how many other support things need to be translated so that we're not leaving people, you know, sort of in isolation with that, but really making sure. So uh, just be curious for the group's take on on just the idea of of translating for accessibility purposes, either languages or ways that, that you might encourage us to be thinking about that. I think it does make sense to look at, at some of those things, some of the, the things that we've talked about beforehand, whether uh, whether it's the tools in the big picture, um, whether it's some of that kind of foundational stuff that maybe isn't so long texted, but is key to setting the stage for some of this. Maybe it's the seven postures. Again, they don't have to be heavy on text, I don't think. It's text and some scripture. Um, but yeah, it seems like those, those could be really important if we want it to go beyond uh, for for reproducibility, I, I think you know you, at some point with a language we've got someone we're touching, right? And that that's why we're doing a language. So somewhere we've got a connection. That's great for that first person that the tool is there. Maybe we've interacted with them, but reproducibility I think requires that there be a little bit more in the language so that they can pass it on, uh, and it's uh, hopefully it's relationally still, but it's it's passing it on. It I think keeps it on track. No. Yeah, there may have been some assumption that uh, 
oh, we have this one person on the team that needs to do the assessment in their language, but the team building thing will still be in English and all of that. So if we're thinking like you're saying, Matt, of no, we, we might be able to actually be doing this with teams where the full team, even the coach is speaking that other language, then that, that will have uh, some greater impact on us as well in terms of what do we need to do for support. And the other big, the other big piece that that we talked about was that that Idui is entering into a new season as an organization. Uh, in that, uh, we're we're creating opportunities for people to to be a part of it, to share in the journey, uh, in in contributing financially uh, to sharing in that way uh, with some of the opportunities. We listed some of the opportunities that that are there, some of the ways that we would be able to uh, use some of those resources to expand and, and reach out to others. But I think the, 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 the piece, especially for this group that I'd love to just continue to have a conversation around is uh, some of those impact stories. You know, Brandon, man, what a, what a, great, what a great thing of, of taking your team through on a, on a two-year journey to really dig into that and and to then be able to you know i when i hear that yeah you'll have some challenge with turning over three you've had two years though of establishing a bit of a dna praise the lord man that's exciting uh of being able to capture some of those types of stories because that's a very different use case than grady doing a three hour you know grady with with a a, a board but then also being able to talk through you know the time when I had to have the one-on-one -on -one church service so that we could go into the next day and have a meaningful interaction, right? Like those are the things where, man, that challenges me. That and 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 as we can capture some of those stories to be able to share that and to be able to then both encourage others but help them catch a vision for for how the transformation happens. How do we make I do we tangible for for other people so that they can be a part of it and so um so with that you know what what's the question or what's the ask i think it's both that impact stories but you know of of saying hey brandon could we you know could we have a conversation i'd love to dig into that a little bit more uh and 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 capture that so we can share it but then also thinking through you know a lot of you are around a lot of different circles and you in thinking about either churches contributing or different individuals contributing to this what what would you say to us as we're beginning this journey we're you know we're we're very experienced in some areas we're we're pretty new on the block in this area uh, as far as really inviting people into being a part of i to we anything that you would encourage us with no, I was just going to say, I think um, what Grady said about that one-on-one -on -one relationship, that's what's uh, kept me in this group of um, first group Berkman and now Ida We is, is the care and connecting in the relationships. And so I think that's so important in all aspects of, of what we're trying to do to bring this to a wider audience. Well, as more things come to your mind, all you have to remember is support at i2we.org. Anytime you want to send any of us anything, you can send it to support and Anadon, Ken will make sure that it gets to whoever it needs to get to. Uh, when you have some of those uh, wonderful wow moments or when you also maybe have some of those challenging moments, you might need some help. You might even want to connect with another mentor coach or something like that. Uh, all you have to do is ask because we are a community of people and we do care about each other in this community as we're always helping other people to build community, helping them in their process of moving from I to we. Guess what? Each of us is on this journey. We are all on this journey of learning to move from I to we. So uh, I hope this has been helpful to you as we're coming to the top of the hour again. Uh, look forward to seeing you again next month with another Grip Berkman Coaches Cafe. Uh, meanwhile, keep doing everything you can to help people build unity in the body of Christ so more people will know Jesus. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Thank you.